Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, let's start. So, <clears throat> today we are going to hopefully conclude the topic of plane frames. <clears throat> if you remember, we ended the last class with this problem where we looked at a bent beam, which is actually a plane frame. And we went step by step into analyzing it and <coughs> first drawing the free body diagrams in statically determinate and then with the help of these diagrams drawing the actual force, shear force and bending moment diagram and trying to understand the deflected shape behavior uh, due to this loading. Let's do another problem. A simply supported, the same bent beam simply supported okay now it's got a gravity load on one side and it's got a horizontal uh, force acting <coughs> on the other side so first find the support reactions we'll do it together so you will also get a taste of it You have 15 kilo Newton. How much of it comes here? How much comes here? Three by five of that will come here. The rest will go there. But this horizontal force will go entirely here because it's a roller. And it also has a clockwise moment. 10 into 1, which has to be balanced by an upward reaction here 10 divided by 5 2 and a downward reaction there of 2 so you should quickly calculate the reactions and you can work it out <coughs> you will get 10 here 8.5 here 6.5 here add it up it adds up to 15 okay so reactions is pretty easy only remember that this horizontal force can generate a moment which will induce a change in your reactions. Now draw the free bodies. Where would you like to start? You can start anywhere, there is no preference because there is no free end here. So, uh, okay, we will start with CD. Now, Please note, you need to be intelligent here. This 10 kN, don't put on to CD because it's going to be unbalanced because this roller can't take it. So the entire 10 kN will go to this side. That's how it reaches here. So draw this with just 6.5 here and then at C you have to put the internal forces which satisfy equilibrium. So 6.5 up means 6.5 down and the 6.5 into 2 is uh, 13 kN meter. You will have to have a clockwise moment. Very easy. Then you take the next segment BC. And when you take BC, whatever you drew here, you have to put here with the opposite directions, right? Newton's third law. In addition, when you add up everything here, you must get the external load here, which is 10. So this 10 also don't forget to put here. So see how systematically you can do this and you'll never make a mistake. So you've got three forces now acting at C. And then you go to B and balance. <coughs> so 10, balance with 10 here. 13 up, 13 down. 
sorry, 6.5 up, 6.5 down. Then you have a 13 anti-clockwise. Well, you also have a 10 into 1 clockwise. So you have a balance of 3, which should be clockwise to get uh, sigma m equal to 0, right? Now you are satisfying equilibrium here fully. Then you take a, b, <coughs> whatever you drew here, three forces, you put them upside down here, opposite sign, so that when you join these two elements at b, there is no net concentrated force or moment. Put the load on this free body, then you work and see what happens here. This 10 will be balanced by 10. And there's no moment here because it's a hinge support there. And you can work out that the vertical reaction turns out to be 8.5. Very simple. 15 minus 6.5, 8.5. You can check the moment at A. The moment at A will turn out to be 0. And then you check whether whatever you got here matches with the reactions that you got. The first cal. That's how you check. This is how <coughs> you Find the internal forces perfectly without any error and you are totally sure that uh, you have done it the right way. You could have started with AB and done the same thing. Now we are ready to draw the three diagrams. Actual force diagram. You can see that only AB and BC have actual forces. CD does not have and the actual force is compression here and compression here. Okay, value is 10, value is 6.5 for BC. Got it? You can write the value compression or you can put a minus sign and say plus means tension. Actual force diagram. First you have to draw the baseline and then superimpose this. Is this clear? Shear force diagram. You can see that you have shear force in all three beams. And how does it go? Well, take this part, 8.5 goes up, then there's a UDL which brings it down by 15 straight line, 15 minus 8.5 is 6.5, so you get 6.5, that finishes AB. You can take CD, CD has a constant shear force of 6.5 and BC has a constant shear force of 10. It doesn't matter which side you draw it, it's not important. Okay. Plus minus not important. <coughs> then you have the bending moment diagram. This you must draw on the tension side. You will find that everything is sagging. Start with the beam AB. The beam AB is like a simply supported beam AB with a <coughs> moment at B which is anti-clockwise which is sagging 3. So it is 3 and then a parabola because you have a UDL. You don't know where the maximum moment is. You can easily find the maximum moment at the location where the shear force changes sign. How to get this distance 1.7? How do you get 1.7? Tell me the calculation. Yes, 8.5 divided by 5. That's all you do. See how fast it is. Because it went up 8.5, it came down at the rate of 5 per meter. So 5 into x is equal to 8.5. x is equal to 8.5 divided by 5. It works out to 1.7. Then you work out the moment there. That's a value. So AB is cleanly done. If you drew on this side, you must automatically draw on this side. For the reason we discussed in the last class, because tension is inside the corner B. So you start with 3 and you can see it matches 3 and then you have again on tension on the left side of 13. So 3 rises up to 13. If you drew 13 here, you must draw 13 here, not inside. Because now the outer corner of C is in tension. And then just one look at this and you say 13 drops to 0. And you can see that. The bending moment diagram varies linearly and that is validated by the shear force being constant. And that is happening in CD and BC, whereas in AB it's all parabolic because you have a UDL. 
and the shear force diagram varies linearly. It's not a constant. So, everything should fit into your mind. So, you understand uh, all three diagrams and you are not worried that the beam has become a frame because you can handle frame. The only additional thing here is actual force. Now, try drawing the bending, the deflected shape. Draw it yourself. Well, this part is clearly sagging and what will this do? Well, everything is sagging. Look at this. This part is sagging, this part is sagging and this, if you look from this side, is sagging. So, a shape like this. This is interesting. Tension on this side, tension on this side and it's likely to roll a bit. Uh, it's likely to roll on which side? Uh, it, it, it likely to roll to the left, no? So, I think some correction needs to be done here. It's going to be pulled. Well, there are two opposing influences. We can't say for sure. Supposing this horizontal load was not there. Then when this is pushed down, the tendency is for this to roll outward. But the 10 kN is going to take it in. But which effect is stronger, you have to work out and see. So, we can't say. You can even leave it at D. It will be somewhere close to D, but it can move either to the left or right, depending on which effect is stronger. That's where you can do actual calculations to find out. Let's say the question is, and maybe let's take this up, we'll solve this problem in the next part. Having come so far, if I give you the EI value of A, B, C, D, can we find out whether D rolls to the left or to the right and how much? We will do this actually very quickly, okay, in the next uh, part. Same problem we will take up. We will say we have already reached here. Let us check whether it moves to the right or left. But <coughs> the shape is correct, tension at the bottom, tension at the bottom and tension at the left, so and 90 degree maintained here, so shape looks okay. And uh, uh, this we will check, okay, so this is an exercise we will take up in a future class, we will solve it ourselves. All right. Now we will do some more practice problems of simply supported frames. Let us say you take the same frame and make it simply supported. You have a loading here which is a horizontal load. Can you draw the free body diagrams? First find the support reaction. You will get a horizontal reaction here at A of P. Will you get vertical reactions? Will you get vertical reaction or not? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Why? Because you can clearly see that this P and this P will bring a couple clockwise. So, obviously, you will have upward reaction here, downward reaction here. And the overturning moment is P into H and the restoring moment is P into H divided by L. Uh, sorry, will be this into L. So, the force is that moment divided by L. Okay, that's how you do it. Now draw the three free bodies. You can see that DB is uh, not, a f not having any forces. You take BC, you begin at the ends where you've already got these two reactions. Oh, well, one is a load and the other is a reaction. Then P to the right, balanced by P to the left, pH pile up, up, pH pile down, but this forms a couple, that into L is pH, that is an anti-clockwise couple, so you have a bending moment here, which is clockwise. Okay, that's how you work it out. And then whatever you put here, and in dB there is nothing, must be reversed and put here. So, you had P to the left, you have P to the right, you had pH by L down, you have pH by L up, you had pH 
bending moment clockwise, you have pH anticlockwise, Newton's third law. So when you join these three elements, you don't have any concentrated force or moment at P. <coughs> okay, so you've got these, then you do balancing. This P is balanced by P here, pH by L here, and you'll find that the moment here turns out to be zero because pH divided by H, uh, P into P uh, cancels that moment. And so you see that it matches with your reaction. That's how you do it. You should keep doing it. Keep checking from one end to the other and go travel and check the reaction. Okay. Now, <coughs> draw the bending moment diagram. You can draw all the, all the diagram, but right now we'll draw just the bending moment diagram. See where the tension is and feel it. Okay. You've got sagging moment here pH into zero, a moment here which with tension on the right side, pH into zero. Two triangles, finished. Can you draw the deflected shape? It's going to look something like this. You have to draw it very carefully. This is obviously sagging, so it will go like that. And this will remain straight. And this you have to draw carefully so that the tension is <coughs> on the right side. <coughs> you must get mastery over this. Sorry, this is curved. Does it look straight? It's curved. Can you tell me how much will be this rotation? Can, now that we'll go ahead, jump ahead. How much will be the rotation at B? Someone asked this question in an interview. Okay, up to here everything is right. How to get the rotation at B? Let's say it's a prismatic frame with constant flexural rigidity EI. What is the value of the rotation of the joint P? Yes. Zero. It doesn't look zero. What do we mean by rotation of joint B? You are saying it's a rigid joint, so rotation should be zero. Is that your understanding of rigid joint? What does rigid joint mean? <coughs> so these are the cobwebs I want to clear. What is the meaning of rigid joint? Right. It only means the, all the elements are welded together in such a way that the Included angles don't change even after deformation. That's all rigidity means. But the joint as a whole can rotate. And the question I'm asking you is, what is, and it's a clockwise rotation, you can see that. Even this straight fellow has rotated. All three members, DB, sorry, BD, BC, BA, rotate clockwise by an angle theta B. My question is, what is theta B? Huh? Sorry? Area of the bending moment. How? No, no, you must think fast. You give me the answer, I don't want to see anything. pH by B. pH by? pH by 3 EI. 3 PHL by 8 EI. How did you get that? So, um, I want you to, uh, this is the whole idea, you to not forget your beams. 
What's your revised answer? I don't want to say anything. Tell me the answer. PHL by 3E. PH? PHL by 3 EI. How did you get it? Okay. Yes. So, you don't get confused by looking at all of them. Which is which of the three is easiest to look at for th to understand rotation? B C, huh? B C or B dash C dash, right? Don't worry too much about it drifting, okay? Because small deformations, the horizontal drift is not important. So, if you take that element B C, B C, you can model it. Well. Actually, you can model it. What will be the boundary condition here? This is roller. What boundary condition would you like to put here? Rotation. Just, well, you can put a rotational spring and all that. But why not just put another roller here? Because if you ignore actual deformations, vertically it's not going to go down. And you can move slides horizontally, yes or no? Now, <coughs> don't worry too much about the P. Who cares? Okay, P is acting there. It's not going to cause the rotation. The only thing which will cause the rotation is a moment here. And that moment, let me call that moment M. All right which in this case turns out to be P into H. And the span is L. If you take a simply supported beam and you apply a concentrated moment on it, you will get a deflected shape which looks like, which looks like this. Yes or no? And you also know that, now, there is a stiffness relationship which you should know very well. We'll study it in the, in the next class. But this is a refresher course. So you should know all this. Um, so what are these? What is this rotation? What is this rotation? And let me take another case. <coughs> Let's say this is fixed. And you have a hinged or roller support here and you apply the same moment M here. You have a rotation, it swings back here, right? Now, if you have flexural rigidity EI and if the span is L, what are these relations? You should know them thoroughly. This is theta, this is theta. What is this theta and what is this theta? Which, and by the way, m by theta is called stiffness. Don't you remember any formulas for stiffness? What is the stiffness of a beam? Rotational stiffness of a beam. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You attended my course. I'm talking to those who, who are fresh. Okay, where have you used the word stiffness? Moment distribution. Moment distribution method, right? And what was stiffness there? The moment required to produce unit. No, no, but generally to find distribution factor and all that, you use something, no? What did you... How did you distribute the moments? In proportion to... What is that stiffness? If I remember right, the way some people are taught, it's I by L or something, right? But I by L cannot be stiffness. Why? I'm saying this for the benefit of everybody because that's how many of us learn. First of all, what is a unit of stiffness? So, Rotational stiffness is what we are talking about. Rotational stiffness. It's a good topic for a change. 
and we'll come back to that. A rotational stiffness is, uh, well, you can have something called translational stiffness, which we all know. What is translational stiffness? Well, let's say you have a multi-story building. Okay. And let's say you apply load P here. And the whole building deflects by, say, delta on top. Right? Now, I can replace the whole thing with a spring. And I apply the same P here, and this spring will contract, and this will move by delta. And so, this is the simple understanding of stiffness. P versus delta follows a law, straight line, and this is called stiffness. Right? K is P by delta. Well, I can talk of a rotational spring, not a translational spring. I can talk of a, uh, a, a spring, which is a rotational spring. And if I apply a moment on this spring, the whole spring will rotate by an angle theta. So I'm going to replace P with M and delta with theta and I've got, I'll use the word k theta is m by theta. This is called rotation stiffness. The other one is spring stiffness or translation stiffness, right? So, the unit of stiffness here will be kilonewton meter per radian or kilonewton meter. How does I by L give you kilonewton meter? I by L will give you meter cubed. So obviously it cannot be a measure of stiffness. So that's a very bad way of understanding stiffness. It is not stiffness. Then you said E I by L. That's a better uh, definition. But how did you get E I by L? Can you tell me the base of that? EI by L is not a bad answer, but what's the basis of that? Well, in your mind, you probably have something like a simply supported beam. And you subject it to pure bending. <coughs> Okay, and you can guess the deflected shape will be like this, and you can see that this subtends an angle. You can say this is theta, or you can say this is theta, right? Here. Okay, and then you can work out a relationship between M and theta. Or you can take a cantilever. And if I apply a moment here M, will it go up or will it go down? It will go down. And let's say this slope is theta. What is M divided by theta? Which is a quick way to get this relationship? You must be knowing many methods, no? Huh? Moment area method is, uh, is one way of doing it. You can do it that way. That is the way mechanical engineers apply. Civil engineers, structural engineers prefer another method which is good to visualize. What is that method called? Conjugate, conjugate beam method. We are going to talk about it soon. So, in conjugate beam method, you take the same beam, first of all, and the fixed end becomes free and the free end becomes fixed. We'll go through the reason for this shortly. 
And this is called the conjugate beam. Conjugate beam. And what is the loading on the conjugate beam? The curvature diagram, the M by EI diagram. <coughs> so you draw the Benny moment diagram, it will look like this. Right? And this will be M divided by EI. Sorry? Ah, good. You are right. This will be like that only if you have a concentrated load. So you are right. So your conjugate beam, because you have a, a moment here which is M, this is pure bending. So you'll get a constant moment, M, M by EI. Now, the total load acting on this beam is how much? ML by EI. And the reaction you get here, this reaction will give you theta, and this moment will give you delta. Remember, you've studied this. We are interested in theta. So theta is the vertical reaction. So theta turns out to be ML by I. So your answer that M by theta is equal to EI by L is for these boundary conditions. Now, if you come back here and apply conjugate beam method, what will you get? If you apply conjugate beam method, your boundary conditions are still hinge hinge or roller roller. And you're going to now put a Benny moment diagram which will look like this, right? And this is going to be M by EI. Agreed? And your boundary conditions are the same. So even if you forget formulas, don't forget fundamental ways of cracking the solution. Now, this total load acting on your conjugate beam will be ML by 2EI, half the, the area of the triangle essentially. How much of that comes here? Two thirds. How much of... So, two-thirds of it comes here and so that's this theta. So this will be two-thirds will make it ML by 3EI and ML by 6EI. Remember this. So if you're talking of rotational stiffness and you have in mind a prismatic beam with the far end hinged, then you say that the stiffness is K theta is 3 EI by L and when you draw this remember that this rotation will be exactly half this rotation so even when you draw it that understanding should be there the rotation at C dash will be half the rotation at B dash if the only thing that causes that rotation is this moment all this should be there clear in your brain when you draw it and in this, you can prove, I don't prove it now, for this boundary condition where the far end is fixed, we'll have a point of counterflexure, it's, it's stiffer than this. And this turns out to be 4 EI by L. So that's how we should have learned the moment distribution method. We'll see it later when we come to that. But remember, stiffnesses are some constant to EI by L in a prismatic element. It could be 1 EI by L, it could be 3 EI by L, it could be 4 EI by L. And if it's 4 EI by L, you can prove that there's a carryover factor here, a moment which is M by 2, which is half of whatever moment you got there. Okay, all this we'll use later. But uh, the answer you should have given, and he gave the correct answer is, this moment, pH, theta is ML by 3 EI. ML by 3i. So pH is a moment. P 
pH into L divided by 3 I. Got it? If I asked you what is the rotation here at C dash, it will be same thing divided by 6 E I. So that is a kind of. Now if I ask you how much does this support roll, then there is an answer to that. We will see that in the next slide. So slowly you, you, I want you to understand that you have to be thorough with the whole moment field and the displacement field and everything should be at your fingertips. You should at least know how to draw correctly and also you should know which part is straight, which part is sagging, which part is hogging and roughly more or less you should know how to get the values. Is it clear? That is the understanding that we want. Okay. Let us take this case. What are your support reactions? You have an overturning moment of M0. So you have a couple here. Will you have any horizontal reaction here? No. But you will have a vertical reaction. And so that is a couple. The Libram is L. So M0 by L, M0 by L. Okay. Straightforward. Now draw the free bodies. They are pretty straightforward. DB remains silent. AB is subjected to an actual tension and this is what you get here. Okay. Draw the bending moment diagram. So you must practice. We begin with simple things and then you can handle multi-storied buildings easily. But begin with small frames. So your bending moment diagram is very simple. No bending here, no bending here, only bending here, one end moment M0, hogging because tension is on top, zero moment here. Now try drawing the deflected shape with all this, un this understanding and the previous slide. Deflected shape will now be like that. In fact, I should have asked you this. This is a tricky thing. Okay, this <coughs> you'll find. Okay, let's come back here. We are actually. It's very interesting. If you take BC, we know that. Let's put it on roller so it can move to the left or the right. And let's say I apply a moment here M. I know that the deflected shape is going to be like this, right? And now I also know that this rotation will be ML divided by 3i. This is ML divided by 6i. So I know that the other end, the rotation is going to be anti-clockwise. I have to draw a picture in which AB remains straight. Now I can't keep it at B and make it straight because I will violate uh, compatibility. So it has to drift either to the left or to the right. The only way it will move has to be like this because then only I have an anti-clockwise moment possible here. This is straight, this is straight. This is a real test. Not many people will draw it correctly. Right? So again, if I ask you, what is the rotation at B, what's your answer? After telling you the whole story, <laughs> M not L by 6 EI. Beautiful. The rotation here is M not L by 3 EI. Here it's 6 EI. Oh, well, this, is, this particular thing is not drawn so well because this should look half of that, but not bad. In fact, the question I should have asked is, what is the rotation at A? What is the rotation at A? Ah, so you have to think the rotation at A is the same as the rotation at B, alternate angles. The rotation of B is? ML by 6 EI, so rotation, so you are thinking ahead. Got it? So you know all the rotation. What is the rotation at D? 
same anti clockwise m not l by 6 ei very interesting so you got many rotations you got rotation at c got rotation at b at d and at a there's only one degree of kinematic indeterminacy one theta and the other one is theta by 2 got it now the other question was is how much does this roll and what's the answer to that <laughs> let's see if do you have to do a lot of calculation or can tell me in one shot? Huh? You're right. So this is a straight line and we're talking very small movement. You know, this is all this is like drawing a cartoon, very exaggerated. So it will be theta A into H. Sine theta equal to theta for small theta. So you got that answer also. Look at this. No calculations. Just this understanding and you got all the answers. So whatever theta b you calculated or theta a into h. Good question to ask in the gate exam, no? How many people will be able to answer? You tell me. Question is, find the deflection at, find how much does the roller support roll? There will be a clean, huh? straight ball hitting the middle stump. But you see, now you can answer it. Why? Because you, are, you have so much of clarity in, in understanding. Is it clear? And that's how the whole subject becomes enjoyable. It's nice to ask simple questions with simple problems uh, where you are really tested. So everything is clear now. Why we encroached into the domain of the right brain. We started looking at deflected shapes, not just drawing Benny Mowen diagrams. And we're getting a feel. Okay, good. Now, remember I asked this question and we did this in the, uh, one of the earlier classes. This is a standard question we ask. And uh, people draw this, this is wrong. This is right. It's similar to a simply supported beam, but it can roll. Some people draw this as one of you did in the last class. But this you're violating the... Uh, rigid joint and you'll find this can roll and this is the correct answer. Okay, good. Let's now talk of three hinged frames and then we'll go into three hinged arches. I've got a, a frame with two hinge supports which would normally make it statically indeterminate but I'm giving a moment release at B, an internal hinge at B. Can you analyze this frame? Tell me what the support reactions are. Well, normally you will say this P, half the load will come here, half the load will come there. Is that okay? Yes or no? No, why not? Why well, that hinge is disturbing you, is it? Then how will that hinge change the answer? What does that hinge tell you, tell me? What does the hinge tell you? Hinge gives you a big secret. Bending moment at B is zero. Actually hinge tells you <coughs> there's no moment transfer. Okay. So with that information, what is the knowledge you gain in terms of reactions? Now let her answer. If the moment there is zero, which reaction is also zero? Horizontal reaction is zero. That's all it says. Does it say the vertical reaction is zero? So that's it. So if this horizontal reaction is zero, what happens with this horizontal reaction? So in what way is this problem different from this problem? Huh? Uh, no, in terms of reactions, same as this problem. Got it? So look at this, this is interesting. So, deflected shape will you do? Can you draw the deflected shape? So I want you to find the reaction. We've already found the reactions. Okay. Now you draw the deflected, the bending moment diagram, the deflected shape. You can draw the free body diagram also.
Bending moment diagram. Now I'm not going to draw free bodies. You should draw, draw that on your own. Bending moment diagram will be the same as in the earlier case, right? Deflected shape. Think and draw. <coughs> in other words, if I had a simply supported beam BC, I know the deflected shape. Symmetric. Uh, I know B will rotate anticlockwise, C will rotate sorry, B will rotate clockwise, C anticlockwise, some theta and the whole joint, now here you are allowed it's not a rigid joint, it's, it's hinged there, so you are allowed a change in angle, here no change in angle so will it sway to the left or to the right? Huh? Okay, that's it. So you begin with this, then you say this can move to the left or right, and you say a change in angle is possible here. So this is theta, this theta, this theta, this theta. And if someone asks you, what is the sway to the left, can you give me the answer? Now that we have gone ahead, the gate exam question is, how much is a sway to the left if all the elements have a stiffness of has a flexural rigidity EI? Well, you can apply the conjugate beam method and and do it for a simply supported beam with a constant with a, we'll see that later. And you can work out theta and theta into H will be that moment. Okay, but at least the shape. Not many people will get the shape correctly. All right, next problem. I shift the internal hinge to the middle of the beam. My reactions, what are the reactions at A and D? Vertical reactions? P by 2, P by 2, no question about that. What will be the horizontal reaction? Yes. <coughs> Anybody, what will be the horizontal reaction? PL by? 4H Now vertical reaction is P by 2, P by 2 Horizontal reaction will be equal and opposite In your mind you should cut a free body here If you cut a free body here the condition equation is bending moment at E is 0 M is 0 So you will find this P by 2 and P by 2 form a couple PL by 4, that has to be balanced by H into L, so it will be PL by 4H, correct. PL by 4H, that's how you should do it fast, the way he did it. Okay, now can you draw the bending moment diagram? You can draw your free body diagram. We have now advanced to a stage where we draw those diagrams in the mind. We don't need to draw it on paper. Draw the bending moment diagram. That's how it will look. What does this diagram remind you of? We've seen this earlier also. So, yeah, almost like a can. This part is going to behave like a cantilever. And that moment is transferred here, and then it has to go back to zero. Got it? Can you draw the deflected shape?
So wherever you give the internal hinge, there the bending moment is zero. So you shift the internal hinge, you can still do it. So these are called three hinge frames. And there's only one way to draw the deflect shape. It'll probably look like this. Okay, so this is going to move symmetrically like this. Now, if the EI is constant everywhere, now let's play this game. If the EI is constant everywhere, how much will be the rotation at A? What does this element remind you of? Zero moment here, constant moment there. It's like that small beam that I showed you. ML by 3EI, ML by 6EI. Here M is whatever moment you got there. And L is H. So you know the rotation here. This rotation will be more than this rotation. Two times this rotation. So you can, so that's how you do it. And this deflection also you can find out it will be like for a cantilever with the P by 2 load, whatever. Remember PLQ by 3i plus this rigid body rotation. We will see that later. So all this you can do quickly. Let us take a little more complicated frame. This, what is this frame called? These frames are called portal frames because they are rectangular. This is also portal frame but there is a name for it. Industrial sheds are like that when you have a sloping roof. What is this called? Gable. gable is typically the name given to the end in the building, but you can call it a gable frame. It's called a pitched portal frame. The other one is called a rectangular portal frame. This is called a pitched portal frame. Pitched meaning inclined. This point is called the ridge. Now, let's see how to analyze this. Is this statically determinant? Yes, it is. You've got an internal hinge there. What are the vertical reactions? Total load is how much? 10 into 12, 120 kilonewton. So, 60, 60 kilonewton, right? You can do that straight away. Don't need any help for that. And the horizontal reaction will be 60 into 6. You find the moment here and divide it by the height 6, you will find it is 30 kN. Okay. Let us say you could do this. You just check it out. Is it 30 or not? Check it out. Take this free body, find the bending moment there and divide by 6. You got 30? Okay, have you got this? A few of you got this? Okay. Now, let us see how to analyze this. Here, it is good to draw free body diagrams. So, take this part and if you want to simplify this frame and take advantage of symmetry, you can throw away one half of the frame. What boundary condition will you put at C? First, the moment is released and it can't move to the left or right. Why it can't move to the left or right? Because you will violate symmetry. But it can move up and down. So this is the boundary condition you will put, roller. So you have reduced this frame to this frame, makes your life easy. And the right side will be the mirror image of the left side. Got it? So instead of dealing with this difficult frame, I can deal with this frame. Okay, so in this frame, I can draw two free bodies, AB and BC. Let me start with AB. I've got the reactions 30 and 60, so I reverse them here, 60 and 30. And <coughs> I find I have a couple here, 30 into 4, 120, to be balanced by a clockwise moment, 120. Got it? Then I draw for BC. 
Now, I'll keep it vertical horizontal. So load is 10 kilonewton meter. Whatever I got here, I put reverse and check whether when you calculate vertical is zero. Yes, 60 up, 10 into six is 60, 60 down, net vertical is zero. <coughs> horizontal is 30, 30. And uh, this height is two meters. So you can check the bending moment at C is zero. Got it? Now, this diagram is not helpful in drawing the shear force diagram and, and actual force diagram. Why it's not helpful? Because you have to convert from the vertical horizontal Cartesian framework to inclined shear and so that you need to do. You know the angles. Okay, let's say the angle is given, this is 2 meter and this is 6 meter, so the ratio is 1 is to 3, the hypotenuse will be root 10, so you can work out the angles. So you can resolve this 30, <coughs> tangential and normal using this. So 30 into root 10 by 3 is this value and 30 into 30 di uh, divided by 3, sorry. L let's say this angle is theta. This is theta, right? So 30 cos theta is this. Cos theta is 3 by root 10. And 30 sine theta is this. 30 sine theta is uh, 1 by root 10. Just check it out. Right? So that's how you get these. So you convert it in this direction. You can also do it on this side. And if you want to get the bending moment at any location x, you can get an expression for the bending moment in shear force. Uh, not shear force, this is a vertical force. And you can convert the bending moment doesn't change. It doesn't depend on x, y coordinate, but you can convert the shear and the, <coughs> the shear is S and the normal is N. You can vertical, horizontal, you can convert like that. And <coughs> you need to find out where you're going to get the maximum uh, <coughs> sagging moment. So find out where the shear force is zero and you can locate what the shear force is zero at a distance one meter from this side and the value of the moment you can work out as five kilonewton. You go through this exercise later. At, after you find this, you can draw the bending moment diagram. Bending moment diagram, tension on the left, tension above, a little sagging. And you see wh what's happening. This height, this horizontal reaction giving, generating so much of hogging moment that it's hogging most of the place and sagging only in a small place, which is something that you normally won't expect. And uh, that's because of the huge height there. And this is how you draw the pending moment diagram. You can draw the shear force diagram. You can draw the actual force diagram from the free bodies. And you can attempt to draw the probable deflected shape a little exaggerated. Now look at this carefully. This is having tension outside, so it will bulge outward. This is having a point of contraflexure and you will have sagging in this region, sagging in this region and hogging in most of it. So this is hogging, sagging. That's how you should draw it. This is a little exaggerated. But a question can be asked, how much does the point C go down? And how much does it spread out at B and D? And that we'll see how to solve uh, later by using uh, the principle of virtual work. We now move from frames to arches. <coughs> Three hinged arches are statically determined. So let's take an arch like this. We'll just do one arch problem to, for completeness. Find out the support reaction. Let's say you can do it. You've got 
100 is shared here and here in what proportion? 100 into 15 divided by 50 will come here. And uh, you can work out. And then your additional equation is the condition equation that the bending moment at C is 0, which means if you take this side, VA into 25 is equal to H into 8. So let's say you solve that and you can use Eddy's theorem. The ideal large for this we already learnt is going to be like that in the last class. And you can guess that here you should have given only this much height but you gave more height so you will get hogging moment, sagging moment, hogging moment. You know this. But now we want to design this, we want to get the bending moments, we want to get the shear forces, we want to get the actual forces. How do we do all that? Well, we know this uh, Eddy theorem. And uh, to get inside and get the values, you need to know the shape of this arch. So what are the standard shapes that people give for this? This is called the span of the arch is 50 meters and the rise of the arch is 8 meters at the crown. You can have typically what shapes? Parabolic shape and one more shape is very common. Segment of a segmental <coughs> arch. So let's do both. Well, whatever shape you take, we've already got expressions for how to find for any uh, location x what is the normal force and the shear force once you have H and V from a equivalent beam. So we've done this. So I'm not repeating. Now segment, let's say you're told this is a segment of a circle. Then you need to find the radius of the circle. How will you find the radius of the circle? Well, you can use your geometry principles or go by, go to this origin and let's say that uh, this is the radius r, radius r, radius r and let's choose x and y here. So this, if this is our x, then if you shift the coordinate here, this will be x minus l by 2. And if this was our original y and you shift the y here, this y will be this y plus r minus h. Got it? That's how you shift the coordinates. Now with this as coordinate system, what's the equation for this circle? What's the equation of a circle? x squared plus y squared equal to r squared. So you put the new x and y, this squared plus this squared is equal to r squared. Right? I've shifted my x, y origin here. So you call it x1, y1. I'm going by basics, so I, maybe there are simple rules, but I'm, this is what I'll never forget. Equation of a circle, I'll never forget. Okay, that's it. Now you know all the values. This is how you work out for a segmental arch. If this is parabolic arch, same thing, slight difference in equation. How will you write the equation? You have to satisfy the boundary condition. This is a standard formula for a, a parabolic arch. You can use y equal to ax squared plus bx plus c and still do it. But if you simplify it, you can do this uh, for uh, this works. You just check it out. When x is equal to 0, y is 0. When x is equal to l, y is 0. When x is equal to l by 2, y is equal to h. Okay. All right. Now, Let's do it for a segmental arch first, then we'll do it for a parabolic arch. If you take this segmental arch, then if you take the free body up to AC, wherever you cut the section, it will look like this. Okay, and the bending moment at C is zero, so you can get H is equal to 93.75. Now, this answer is the same whether it is uh, parabolic or not. We found this answer earlier. Did we find? It doesn't depend on the shape of the arch. It only depends on the values of 25 and 8. Having found this, we are now going to find the equation for this circle. 
and we go by this equation we can simplify it and you can get this equation and if you plug in the values you will get uh, you will get an expression okay this is interesting after you write this equation you can write it like this and you have to take the derivative of this because you need y dash to get your um, shear force and actual force. So you, this involves some calculation. I'm not going to make you break your head over it, but I'm giving you a methodology. You have to write all this. And then you can draw, use Eddy's theorem and draw your, uh, your line of thrust. And you can put it down on the ground and make the bending moment diagram simpler. You get these values by plugging in uh, your expressions, which we showed earlier. And you can write equations for bending moment. Very easy to write. For this portion, up to 35 meters, it's one equation. And for the portion beyond, it's another equation. Okay, easy to do this. Bending moment is easy. Shear force is also easy. Uh, not shear force, the vertical force is constant. 30 kN up to D and minus 70 in this region. H is constant, 93.75. With that, <coughs> you have to plug into this and work out your values. You've got to get the value of Y and Y dash. Let's say you divide into many parts. So let's say we do a few parts. You can do more parts. And then plug in the value of Y, plug in the value of Y dash and then do this transformation and convert your V and H into N and S. And after you do this, you can draw the, three, the bending moment diagram, the shear force diagram, and the normal thrust diagram, the actual compression diagram. You don't need to do all this in practice. You just need to get the critical values. Where is your bending moment maximum? At that location, what is your actual compression? What is your shear force? Where is your shear force maximum, etc., etc. So, you, nobody wants you to calculate all the values, except in an exam or in an assignment. Just the critical values. But roughly, you, if you want, you can find anything you want. Okay. Similarly, you can do it for a parabolic arch. But let's take. Let's. I like questions which tease your brain. So I'm giving you this parabolic arch. Hmm. Uh, and you tell me how to solve this. At least give, give, give me the support reactions. If this is parabolic, remember we did in the last class, even if you didn't put the hinge in the middle, you know how to crack all the answers. So you should do this fast, but you can write the equation of the parabola, y, y dash, okay, and you can find out the reactions at the two ends, 30 into 6, and 3 fourth of it comes here, uh, comes here, and 1 fourth of it goes there. So you can find out the horizontal reaction. Uh, let's just check by the quick method we did. What did we say? Supposing the whole thing was loaded on both sides, what is the horizontal reaction? Huh? W L squared by 8H. Will you calculate that? 30 into 12 squared by 8 into 2.5. You got something? You just have to divide by 2. Are you getting? So, so this is not taking that uh, brainy calculation. This is the hard way, the normal way. But that's a quick way of doing it. <coughs> this took advantage of the hinge there. There we didn't take, we don't need a hinge there to get that value. Okay. Well, anyway, you do this. And then you can write expressions. Uh, for, write down expressions for bending moment, for vertical force. And... You know, we've done this earlier. This is the ideal arch, you know, it's 
the bending moment diagram for a beam with half the load. At, you know which part is sagging and hogging and you can actually work out these values and find out the arch profile and again do the same operation. Okay, so you will find that there is not too much of difference between the segmental and the parabolic and you can play with other arches. There is the elliptical shape and uh, you can give your own shape. Okay, so these are similar diagrams. I won't spend time. Last topic, two hinged arches. This arch, is it, can you find the reactions? <coughs> well, vertical reactions you can, but horizontal reaction can you find? No. Why can't you? There is no internal hinge anywhere. So this is statically determined. But you can sketch the deformed shape. And uh, the question I want to ask you is, this is statically indeterminate. If I shift the load to the left, how will it deflect? Will it deflect like this? Or will it deflect like this? I want to check out your right brain quality. A or B? Huh? Sway will be to the right or to the left? Huh? To the right, not to the left. But I thought the load is eccentric to the left. Why will it be to the right? All of you feel it's to the right? In the normal class, I think you have some background. Majority will say it moves to the left. Nobody feels it goes to the left? Okay. Now, can you give me a reason why? Anybody? Well, you've studied uh, advanced methods like moment distribution and all that. So, remember, this is <coughs> a problem with sway. So, if you did moment distribution method, if you remember, you can't do it in one shot, right? So, you do moment distribution, you will find that you first do what is called a non-sway problem, which means you, you arrest it in your mind and then what do you do? So, uh, the, so then you will figure out whether the reaction here is to the left or to the right. Now, can you give me that argument? If I prevent it from swaying, will the reaction here be to the left or to the right? And why? At least let me get that done. You, you are students who already studied indeterminate structures. So with that understanding, can you tell me? Okay, how do you do my moment distribution method? You do fixed end moments. Which fixed end moment will be more, here or here? Left or right? Left. Left, right? So when you do your distribution, then in this column, the moments in this column will be more or this column will be more? Left or right? It will be left because whatever moment you have in the beam end will spill over into the column, right? And what will be the horizontal reaction here? It will be, it will be, see the moment here will be half the moment here, is it not? Carryover effect only. And this moment plus this moment divided by, by the height will be your horizontal reaction. Right? Your, your moment in your beam is anti-clockwise and this moment will be clockwise and half the moment will carry over here. Yes or no? So both are clockwise, so the, re the reaction here will be from left to right. Agreed? Wait, left to right, and here it will be right to left. And these moments will be less than these moments. So you will have a net horizontal reaction, left to right, <coughs> which has to be balanced by right to left in this imaginary support. Whatever you put here, you have to get rid of. And then you have a pure sway problem. Here you have no doubt it is going to sway to the right. 
and this is one way of understanding. So the net diagram will be this plus this, which means this is the correct way to move. The other thing in your intuition is, what happens if you keep pushing this load more and more to the left, and you push it down hard? Will it move to the left or to the right? You can feel it's going to move to the right. So there are many ways of uh, tuning your intuition. Okay, so there's a non-sweep. We'll come to this soon. Uh, how to do moment distribution and so on. Is this problem, this is statically indeterminate and there's a way to do it by the force method. How do you do it? Well, treat your, your horizontal reaction is the one which is unknown. Vertical reactions are known. Let this be your redundant. Your bending moment diagram is this, but you don't know the values of these hugging moments. But if you knew x, you could crack everything. Right? Now, and you know what this value will be. So how to get x? Well, imagine a primary structure where x is 0, which means you make one of them roller supports. Then, we've done this earlier, then the deflected shape, this will be straight, this will be straight because there will be no bending moments in the columns. And this is going to move to the right. So what you need to do is to push it back so that the deflection you get here outward is neutralized by the deflection you get here inward. And that's the amount of x that you have to apply. And that's the principle of consistent deformation. Then you'll get a shape like this in the many moment diagram. So all this we'll learn when we'll do indeterminate structures. So uh, we will stop here. And uh, you, you want me to finish? There's just three slides left. You want me to finish? Finished frames. Okay. What about this problem? Is it statically indeterminate or determinate? It's a prismatic frame. It looks indeterminate, but if you use the tricks that I told you, or there are some more tricks to learn. Let's see. This uh, vertical reaction, can you guess? Yes. This is typically you get from a lateral load. This is so this is called the windward column and this is called the leeward column. And so it's going to overtone <coughs> the frame clockwise. And so you'll have to have an upward reaction here and a downward reaction here. This reaction puts the column in tension, this puts it in compression. What will be the reaction, vertical reaction? pH by L. What about the horizontal reaction? Can you give a good guess for the horizontal reactions? It could be anything, but intelligent people can guess well, boy or girl. What will be the reaction? Huh? P by 2, P by 2, no? Can you prove it? You can prove it. So your guess is correct. It's, if it's P by 2, P by 2, then it's statically determinate. But how to prove it? So there's a lovely proof. So if it's X, this will be P minus X. We don't know what it is. But the frame is symmetric, let's say, and then you, whenever you have a symmetric frame subject to an unsymmetric loading, you can apply a clever principle of superposition. This is what you do. You say this loading is this plus this. Very interesting. Right? P by 2 plus P by 2 add up to P and P by 2 acting in this direction, P by 2 acting in this direction add up to 0. Perfectly valid. This frame when you press inward on top and you assume actual deformations are negligible, will do no nothing. This is already determinate because you'll have no bending moment, no shear force, no reaction. You'll just have a actual compression in this member equal to P by 2. Already solved. So the reactions you get are from this. And this intuitively you know is going to give you reactions like this. And you'll have a deflected shape like this. Very interesting. It's called antisymmetric. Right? Both these columns will have identical deflections, identical bending moment diagrams. And the beam will do this kind of somersault with a point of counterflexion in the middle. The left half and the right half will be antisymmetric. 
And remember this, this picture is familiar to us. A moment acting here and, and no moment here. ML by 3i. So there's nothing uh, difficult in this. So that's a powerful understanding. And so whatever shape you got here, you can draw there. And remember, you studied uh, portal method, cantilever method. And all. That's how you assume the point of counterflexion in the middle of the hinge. And so once you know P by 2, the free bodies are easy to draw. And you could get this question. You can calculate the bending moment diagram. And the bending moment diagram on the tension side is this. So it takes you two minutes to do this if you guess correctly. OK, I'm going to end with some practical stuff. This was a book published in 1998 by McGraw-Hill. The cover page was an interesting building we designed in Cochin. Uh, it was built in 1987 for the National Games. And uh, any of you from Cochin here? OK, so this is a GCDA state, stadium at Kadwandra. In those days, you could actually see it. Now I think it's all covered. Except when the floods came and knocked down a lot of buildings and trees, and you could see them. So it's shaped like a ship. It's a tremendous piece of architecture. The architect's name is N.M. Salim. And he basically needed a lot of help from engineering because this was all engineering. He said, I want a shape like this. He made a model. But how to draw this in two-dimensional drawing? So you have to be very good in, in drawing. That's why engineering drawing is so important. And this is uh, and this appeared in the cover page of our book. After that, two more editions have come with different cover pages. So most of you have probably not seen this. I just want to show you the thrill of designing frames mm -hmm. by hand. Those days, uh, we didn't have computers. I still have the calculation sheet. So we just scanned a few pages just to give you some thrill. Now, this is uh, very complicated structure. The entire roof is suspended on four columns. These are concrete columns. And there are trusses hidden here. And there are, th these are actually kind of cables which pick up the truss. And this whole thing was solved by applying the theorem of least work, which we are going to study soon. No computers. And we predict the deflection, and it, it matched. Sheeting roof. And this is a five-storied building. Uh, I actually went and stayed there later. Uh, lovely rooms, guest rooms. I think uh, people use it for weddings now. And there's a lovely indoor court inside. And there were a lot of challenges. This is your gallery, your, and you have um, you have uh, a staircase with an increasing spiral. So it was a little complicated. If you take that staircase, it's an increasing helical arch. Uh, very interesting to design manually. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, we used an MTech student. That was his MTech project, and we we cracked it. But very interesting. Now I just want to show you how frame analysis can be used. We're going to end with a practical example. How do you actually design a building like this by hand? So I'm going to take one of those typical frames. Frames here is like this. You have a, a, a overhanging portion. Then you have a gallery portion. You've got some columns inside, which you don't see here. And uh, these are columns. These are cross-shaped columns, uh, one meter by one meter. How do you design a cross-shaped column? So you have to generate your own interaction curves. The design is another issue. But how do you work out uh, the design? Now, if you take a look at this frame, this part is statically determinate. You can see that because it's a cantilever. And you know the loads on that. But the rest of it, you have to do frame analysis. And those days, a colleague of mine had just come back from Dubai. He had a four-line... Um, what do you call the programmable calculator, a Casio programmable calculator. And uh, the language was very simple. What language was the basic language? Uh, so you, you can program code. So I did this whole thing by matrix methods, because I didn't want to do it manually. So you have to generate the stiffness matrix for this from first principles. 
and uh, this, this is how we used to do calculations. Hmm? See, uh, 189 pages of calculations. I'm just showing you four or five pages. Nowadays, people just press a button and get the stat output and give five volumes and give it to you, and you don't know what to do with it, and then you give it, put it aside. But uh, those days, you had to do it all manually. See, plans and framing elevations, design of precast steps, floor and roof slabs and secondary beams, analysis of main frames and design of columns, design of main frame building, staircase and helicoidal ramp. And there's one more section on the roof. Okay, this was only the reinforced concrete part. And this is how we did manually by <coughs> drawing <coughs> the typical framing plan. <coughs> this is that arch. This is that frame. And I'm not showing you the program of how we wrote the stiffness matrix and all that, but a lot of calculations and you know, corrections. And I'm just showing you some sample pages of how these calculations are done. These are stiffness values, total load matrix, and you have to check the stiffnesses to make sure everything is correct. And then you can draw the deflected shape. And we found that the deflections were too much here and more important, the moment generated here, the statically determined is so high, it's about 4,100 kilonewton meter, and the backspan moment was only 1,750. So the, this moment minus this moment goes to this column, and that was a huge moment, and almost half of it will spill over to the foundations, and you had pile foundations, and they were very difficult to design. So we had to find an engineering solution. Can you give suggestions how to solve this problem? How to reduce the load on the foundation and make this more economical? So you can play. See, once you've got the program, you can play. That's, a, you know, the, you're the master. The output is your toy. You've validated it. You want to reduce the deflections. You want to reduce the bending moments. And you've got an architect who somehow wants to build it. <laughs> and you, you are the engineer, you've got, you say it's not possible, it's too expensive, you have to. So you say, okay, how to make it cheap and how to make it look good? So you play. So I want to give you an example. So how to reduce the moments which reach the foundations on the, from the column is, you increase the stiffness of the backspan and make it look good. And that's what we did. So this is my own hand calculation. This was the overhanging portion. We said, why don't we flare this and make it look good and spread out like this so that this stiffness is so large compared to this stiffness. Most of this moment spills over here and very little goes there. And we did that analysis, got the bending moments, did the design. You can see all the reinforcement Finally, you produce drawings out of it, but then this is the detailing. Make sure you have enough steel. All this done by hand. And then you give it to a draftsman and it's, it's drawn. And so what happened was we did this. And the architect said, this shape looks good. Go ahead, do it. But the end, at the end of the day, the moment is reduced. So now this is how you draw free bodies. Okay, you get the computer output and you convert it, see, I like using colors, so vertical forces, one color, horizontal forces, bending moments, convert it to shear forces and actual force. Same thing that we showed you here. And all the free bodies are there, and so you know exactly what's going on. And uh, you see what's happening. 4048 kilonewton meter was the moment we got there, but now we've got a huge moment going there, 3420. Only 628 kilonewton meter goes to the column, which is very high five storied high and only 202 kilonewton meter has to go to the foundation and you design it with multiple piles with the pile cap just to show you that this is how design can be done okay so plain frames i showed you but finally a good understanding of it you have to apply and you can build beautiful structures like this uh, or any other structure today people do it blindly with uh, a software. Nothing wrong. But you can still play these games. But you need to check your output. You have to see how much is the deflection. 
and you have to go there and see it getting built. And there were many issues. Sometime later, they are all design issues. Sometime later, we can talk. So that's how we do it. So we have come here, and in the next class, we cover the last topic in statically determined frames, and that is influence lines. Okay, thank you.